to Greenhouse. I'm Mike Patz. I'm one of the pastors of Greenhouse, and I want to welcome everybody that's down in South Florida, that's in Central Florida, Pastor John, Pastor Troy, Preacher Dale was preaching last week in South Florida. Welcome. We're in a series that is called Binge Worthy. It's all about the Bible. Go to Luke chapter 24, and we're going to dig into this. I love preaching. I wish I was in a room with people, but I'm not, so you're going to be there in your room, wherever you're at, uh, on a couch with some people, hopefully, and it reminds me of... The black church I was reading about this week where there was a saint of a grandma that was there and she was always interested in Jesus getting preached and exalted. And sometimes when the preacher would begin to drift into into moralizing and drift into what sounded more like religion than the gospel, she would just shout out in the middle of a sermon, hey preacher, lift him up. Lift him up because it's all about Jesus. Lift him him up. Now, I need you to know that the goal of my preaching today is to lift him up. The goal of any good sermon, in my opinion, is not just to talk about the Bible, but it's to lift Jesus up. The the goal of good theology is to lift him up. The goal of good hermeneutics and exegesis is to get to Jesus and to lift him up. And I won't lie, by the time we're done preaching, I'm done preaching today, I am hoping and praying that you're going to be worshiping Jesus on the spot because the goal is to lift him up. Now, the question is, is, is this a bit of a stretch? Because I'm going to be making the claim today that the goal of good theology or good interpretation, that when I'm going through this book, that the goal from cover to cover is to get to Jesus. But the question is, last week we even referenced some things about exegesis, which means pulling out of the text what's there, not eisegesis, which means to put into the text what's not there. The question is, are we guilty perhaps of trying to force something by trying to get Jesus into every book of the Bible? And I'm hoping by the time we're done that you're going to realize that the greatest hermeneutic someone can have is to lift him up. So Luke chapter 24, if you would stand to your feet wherever you're at, I'm going to pause just for a minute. Luke 24, stand up, straighten out those knees, get the blood flowing, agree with someone around you, say, let's do this in the name of Jesus. And we're going to start Luke chapter 24 and verse 13. And once again, I'm so glad you're with us today. It's such a joy to bring these words. And we're going to look at Jesus now. Verse 13, Jesus has risen from the dead. It says, now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came and walked along with them. How fascinating that two random, not even main 12 disciples are walking along and Jesus walks with them. And it says in verse 16, but they were kept from recognizing him. And by the way, that's a lot of us, a lot of times when we're reading the Bible, that's a lot of our culture, a lot of the time when we're walking through life, we are being kept from recognizing him. And he asked them and he said, what are you discussing together as you walk along? I love it because Jesus asks questions where he already knows the answer. I wonder what kind of discussions you've been having about COVID or what the questions that you've been having about racial tensions or about the future of your career or about the destiny on your life. What are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still and their faces were downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened in these days? To which Jesus says, what things? It's just a beautiful question. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people, the chief priests and all the rulers. They handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day now since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning, but they didn't find his body. And just to give you the snapshot of what we've not read up until this point, Jesus has been crucified. He's been buried. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. They came and they told us what they'd seen, a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. And he said to them, 
how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory and beginning, and this is the key verse today, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I'm going to talk today on this subject that the Bible is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Let's pray and then you can have a seat. Father, help. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Whew, I can't wait to talk about this right now. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Now, we're doing this series. You know, one of the most searched topics in Google every year is how to read the Bible or how to interpret the Bible. It's one of the questions that, that a lot of people have, which is how should I approach this? Last week we talked about exegesis and hermeneutics. Exegesis has to do with getting what the Bible meant then and there. It was the, the context historically and what the author is saying and the intention and the words that are being used. It's the context and the content of then and there. And then hermeneutics, and that's going to be the key word today, hermeneutics really has to do with, with what does it mean here and now? Like what is the meaning of this? How am I to interpret these words now? Now, when I use the term hermeneutics, there are a lot of different approaches to the Bible. There's a lot of different hermeneutics. I'm going to let you know that at Greenhouse, we take a very high view of the Bible. Now, that's a hermeneutical term, meaning and it, when it comes to interpretation, when it comes to the scriptures, we take a very high view, meaning that we believe despite human frailty and weakness, that God is so strong and so good that he's chosen to reveal himself and to maintain and sustain his word, even though humans are fallible, God is so strong that he's able to use infallible humans to bring us a word that we would say is infallible in when it's interpreted the right way. So when we come to this now, we take a very high view of scriptures. Now, some people take lower views. For example, there are people that would say, hey, I'm like a red letter person. You know, I just read the red letters. That's all I do is get into the red letters. And I disregard a lot of the rest of it. With all due respect, I get what people's intentions by that. And of course, if you've not, never read much of a hard copy of the Bible, some copies have the words of Jesus in red. And so some people say, well, if Jesus never talked about it, it didn't matter. But there's things that Jesus never talked about. Like Jesus didn't talk about rape, and yet we would know that rape is wrong. Jesus didn't talk about a lot of things that we would say are very important or unimportant because he assumed, because he was looking at the entire scripture, that people believed it and they got it. So what I'm just letting you know right now is that when we come to scripture now, we've, we take a hermeneutic with the Bible that I'm just going to be honest with you. It's what I would call a Jesus-centered hermeneutic, which means it's all about Jesus. I'm going to say it again. It's all about Jesus. When you're reading Genesis, it's got to get back to Jesus. When you're reading Leviticus, it's got to get back to Jesus. When you're reading the Psalms, you need to get it back to Jesus. And I'm going to try to explain why. So, Got three thoughts today. The first one is this. Why, why is it all about Jesus and why do we have a Jesus-centered hermeneutic? Uh, number one, it's because it's theologically accurate. It's theologically accurate. Several years ago, I was with missionary Sam in a, an Asian country, and we were, uh, we had been, you know, walking the streets and, and doing some different things, and, and I'd been, and, and the Indian food is very, very scrumptious, and it's very tasty, but if you've ever been in another country, and you're not used to the food, and you're missing your own food, we had been there for like a week, and I remember there was like a Domino's pizza on the other side of the road, and I could not wait to get to, to go get some of this, and so I remember we were going to cross the road, and there was... It was a big road, and you had to walk across and, and kind of get in the middle. And one of the guys uh, got stuck in the middle, and he was really having a hard time getting across the street because it was sort of, I don't know, it was, it was scary. There's a lot of traffic and whatnot. Uh, but we wanted to get to the other side. I wanted to get some Domino's pizza, which means we needed to get to the other side. We had to get all the way to the other side, not to sit there halfway in the middle. What I need you to see is that when Jesus says in verse 27, of Luke 24, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, that beginning Moses, Moses would refer to the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The prophets go all the way through Malachi, the last prophet, beginning with Moses, going all the way to the prophets. He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. 
Now, it's an interesting word here, and I, this week I just kept chewing on this. He explained to them, and some versions say he interpreted to them. It's, it's an interesting word, this word explained. It's, it's dear menu. It's dear menu, okay? It's, it's made up of two. It's a compound word. One part is, is dia, would be like, or dia. It's kind of like what, to, to go across something, to get across something, to, to thir- go thoroughly across. And the other is the word ermenuo, or where we would get like, it looks like hermeneuo. It's where we get the word hermeneutics. So in other words, what what it says that Jesus is literally doing here is, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them, or he gave them a thorough crossing of the street, a thorough hermeneutic of all of the scriptures and showing them that it concerned himself. In other words, if you want to go to a passage, if you open up your Bible and you want to cross that street to go from listening to a sermon and it's just a TED talk and getting to the other side and you get to the kingdom of God, or if you want to read the scriptures and you're just reading good motivational self-help and you go all the way across the, the D. Ermanua, if you're going to do the thorough crossing to the place of full truth, what Jesus says is, you're going to have to get to me. In other words, You have not done the thorough hermeneutic. You have not done the thorough crossing over. You have not done the full interpretation until you've gotten to Jesus. See, when I read Bible stories, but I don't put them into the story, I'm just doing TED Talks. I'm just doing Aesop's fables. When I read about Zacchaeus, But if I don't get to Jesus, when I'm reading about David and Goliath, but I don't get to Jesus, I haven't gotten there yet. When I'm reading about Noah's ark, but I don't get to Jesus, if all I have is animals two by two, if all I have is an ark of gopher wood, I haven't yet crossed the street and gotten to that Domino's pizza. If you have not gotten to Jesus, you have not done the thorough hermeneutic because Jesus says it's all about Jesus. Every story, every genealogy Every command, every proverb, every poem in some way is pointing to the greatness or the fullness or the wisdom, the redemption of Jesus Christ. And until you get to Jesus, you haven't done your thorough hermeneutics yet, at least according to Jesus. And it is going to be my claim before we're done that he's the author. And when I want to know the meaning of a book, I want to know from the author himself. I'm going to read you a passage in Colossians, in Colossians chapter 1. If you want to look there, it's going to be up on the screen. But in Colossians chapter 1, Paul makes the point that, that all of Scripture, that he would agree that it's theologically accurate to say that it's all about Jesus. In verse 15 he says, The Son, capital S, Son, that's Jesus. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Oh, don't tune out. Please listen to these words in faith. For in him, in Jesus All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Now, I'm going to say, I want to say that strong. In everything, that Jesus might have the supremacy. Think about our culture right now, the cultural wars that are going on right now. One of the key words in culture right now is this word supremacy attached to whiteness. The racism that's arisen out of white supremacy, to which it's, it's caused so many um, fights and arguments and controversies. And yet what we find here is that God makes it clear that in all things, Jesus would have the preeminence, the supremacy, the first place. In other words, all the other supremacies must bow. Now, let me just do a real quick time out because... If you have a supremacy other than Jesus' supremacy, it's rare that you're aware of your supremacy because we've got blind spots that don't even notice our supremacies. So if you are a person that that holds on to white supremacy, don't be surprised if you don't know it yourself. Supremacies are like bad breath. Other people tend to know it better than you do. Which is why if you've got white supremacy ruling some of your life, you wouldn't even know it, which means you might need to say, God, is it me? 
But just so we're clear, there's, there's a lot of supremacies besides white supremacy in the world. I'll tell you one very big one is, is uh, financial. Or, or I, there are people that treat money as there are companies, there are families, there are individuals that treat the bottom line, that treat finances. They make all of their decisions based on money. They choose their careers based on money. They, they pick what, they're, they're, what major they're going to have based on money. They let every, in other words, everything lines up and points to how does this affect my money? It's financial supremacy. There are some people, it's, it's their sexuality, it's their, it's their sex. I've talked to so many different people that, that their, uh, their, exp- their sexual expression, nobody can tell them what to do with their self. And yet scripture says that in all things, he might be supreme. So, so why do we have, why does our hermeneutic need to be all about Jesus? Because it's theologically accurate. According to Jesus, it's theologically accurate. If you're going to cross that, that road and, and you're going to do a de-hermeneutical, if you're going to do the, the thorough crossing over of the hermeneutic, you've got to get to Jesus. Because the Bible is not a book, and you need to understand this, the Bible is not a book of a whole bunch of commands and God throws stories in to illustrate them. The Bible is one big story where the commands are thrown in to illustrate the story. To review from a couple weeks ago, this is one big book from one big author whose name is God. And it's got one big message, which is the redemption story of the kingdom of God. And it's got one big hero, and that's Jesus the king. So it's theologically accurate to let Jesus be the center. And Jesus is the one that's giving this. Um, One of my heroes is John Perkins, and I was on a call with him at one point, and he's written multiple books, and I remember at one point we were reading one of the books and kind of thinking, you know, I think what John Perkins meant when he wrote that was X, Y, Z. It's interesting, though, when you're on the phone with the author of the book that you're reading, because then John Perkins gets to interject and say, Mike, I appreciate the fact that you're reading my book, and I think it's nice that you're trying to figure out what I meant, but would you like me to tell you what I meant about what I wrote? And what Jesus Christ is doing in Luke chapter 24 is the author of the book, the author of the story, comes down on a road to Emmaus and tells two disciples that are downcast and hopeless what he meant when he wrote a book through Moses and David and Joshua and Solomon and Malachi and Hosea and the book of Matthew or Mark or Luke right here. So why do we need to have a hermeneutic that's all about Jesus? Number one, it's theologically accurate. Number two, it's practically wise. It's practically wise. Um, Until you get to Jesus, the, the scriptures, they're really not all that different from a lot of other scriptures because Jesus says a lot of things, the red letters, a lot of the prophets said a lot of things that are in a lot of other holy books, that are in a lot of other systems of morality. So when you take Jesus away, there's a practical concern that it's, it's really nothing but religion. It's really nothing but self-help, which I'm going to contrast here in a second because I want to tell you that when you do self-help, that when you do behavior modification, that when you do um, just good motivational stuff, it may, it may somehow um, modify you, but it never transforms you. And the promise I'm going to give you is that when you take this book all the way to Jesus, you get changed. I promise. Uh, people are fallen. Like, like we, we, are, we are fallen and we're incomplete. Um, I was talking to someone recently and I was on a Zoom call and I, and I threw that out there and I said, listen, I believe every one of us humans has been born, bro- that we're all born broken. Because a lot of the rhetoric in our culture right now is that if however you were born, it must be okay because you're made in God's image. Here's how the line of thought goes. You're made in God's image, so how- however you are born, it must be okay. So whatever that way is that you were born, um, God can't be against that. So now what we're going to say is whatever you feel like you were born like, that's going to trump whatever you see in the Bible here because, because it must be fine. To which I would say to you, you are made in the image of God, However, since the Garden of Eden, when our first parents sinned, all of us have been broken and incomplete, and something is missing. I was, uh, we were eating a, a meal recently, and uh, it, was, it would have been a very delicious meal, but there was one very important ingredient that was missing from the dish. 
And when you didn't have that one ingredient, it really changed. You, and you, you ate it and you're like, wait, something is missing here. And people are doing the same thing with their lives. They're saying, I feel like something is missing. And so what we do when we feel like something is missing, we, we try to go complete ourselves. And so we, we're in a career and we're like, ah, I don't think this is it. I think if I could get the right career, then, then I would be, then I could complete myself. Or, or for some people, it's if, if only I could get more knowledge or if only I could get more education or if only I could get more of this. Or, or a very common thing is if only I had someone to be married to, if only I had a, a significant other. I even hear people say things like, I married her because she completely me, And I always cringe when I hear that because according to scripture, there's only one person and one thing that can complete any of us. And it's not another spouse, which is why the divorce rate is as high as it is because people sure got their hopes up. It's not a certain job because people get jobs and then they have to change jobs. It's, it's not just another pleasure. And so I'm going to read you uh, verse 22 where Paul says, this is the message of the cross, which is foolishness, verse 18 actually, foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. Verse 22, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. So so here's what happens. When we don't focus on Jesus, we start using the Bible to give you like 10 good tips to live a happier life, or five good tips toward financial health, or um, seven good steps toward being a great dad, or uh, you know, great three great thoughts about um, how to have a spectacular marriage, or um, you know, four good thoughts from the book of Proverbs on how to you know kiss your you know person on your wedding day. Whatever those little ideas, all these different things, all these thoughts of like when I'm not focusing on Jesus, I'm going to use this to try to squeeze out these principles, but when I get the principles, but I don't get the prince of the principles, I miss something that's drastic. When I do not put this in the overall message of the story, which is, according to what Paul says right here, Christ in him crucified, the message of the cross, when I fail to do that, I automatically turn the Bible into self-help. And yet John said, Jesus said in John 15, 5, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. Now, I I grant to you, our culture doesn't believe that. I was uh, listening to Chris Cuomo that was on, I think it was this week, on one of the, you know, on the news somewhere, and he was saying this about all the COVID stuff. He said, if you believe in one another, and if you do the right thing for yourself and your community, things will get better in this country. You don't need help from above, it's within us. This, this is like the, the gospel of the day. You don't need help from above. It's within us. To which Jesus Christ says, you don't have help within you. Your help is outside of you. And you've got the ability within you to believe in this. But you're going to have to reach up. You, so when Cuomo says, you don't need help from above. It's within you. Jesus would say, no, no, no. You do need help from above. It's not within you, but it's within me. And if you'll turn to me, something great's going to happen. So when I'm looking at First. Corinthians chapter 1, when I get down to verse 30, it says, it is because of him, that's Jesus, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Boast in the Lord. Okay, what what am I saying? You've got to catch this, watch. Watch. Until you get to Jesus, the Bible can be used to just guilt trip you, shame you, condemn you. Even if you're reading the New Testament. You're going to read in the New Testament where the Bible, Jesus says, be holy as God is holy. Be perfect as I am perfect. You're going to read things that if you're not careful, they just become more rules and more law until you get to Jesus. 
It's one of the problems that we have right now because the world that we live in, it shames us, scares us, threatens us, cancels us into behavior modification because what the world does, it's a message of cleaning the outside of your cup. What Jesus does is he doesn't just, he doesn't just modify us, he changes us into new people by cleaning the inside of the cup. Mike, what are you saying? I'm saying we need a hermeneutic. We need an approach to the Bible where we always get to Jesus because, number one, it's theologically true. He's the hero of the story. Number one, it's theologically true. But number two, it's practically wise because when you come to Jesus now, he fulfills He fulfills a a tension that gets open. He fulfills a loop that gets opened when you read the scriptures. And there's there's this longing inside that only can be filled by the wisdom of Jesus himself. And then finally, number three, it's not just theologically accurate and practically wise. Number three, it's, it's spiritually powerful. We read this a moment ago, but in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 1, it says, The message of the cross, it's foolishness to those that are perishing. Someone asks you right now, what does America need? Here's my answer. It needs the cross. To which some people say, oh, that's foolishness. That's foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Chapter 2, verse 1 in 1 Corinthians, Paul said, And so it is with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I didn't come with eloquence of human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. I resolved to know nothing. I, I dare you to do the same thing, by the way. I resolved to do nothing, to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Now, Lord, I ask you, and even though this is being recorded in advance, I'm asking God by the power of his spirit even now to confirm these words. May the power of the spirit of the living God touch your body right now. Some of you that it's been as if you have been shaking in fear or torment or anxiety. There's, there's been a stress that you've not been, that's not been able to lift. Even now, receive peace in Jesus' name. Be at peace in the name of Jesus. Even now, may the power of the living God touch your body, your back, your ears, your head, that something inside of you would burn, that you would know that he's watching you, he sees you, and he loves you. Paul said, when I came, I resolved to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. Right now, I pray over you in the name of the crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ. Best news there ever was. See, here, here's, this, is, this is why Paul says, when I read this book and when I preach this book, I resolve to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. Now, it's interesting because Paul was only preaching the Old Testament. So my question is, how could Paul be serious when he was only reading from Genesis to Malachi, and yet he said, when I came to you, all I talk about is Christ and him crucified? And the answer is, Because Paul didn't just read the Bible, he interpreted the Bible. Because Paul didn't just get to the middle of the street, he crossed all the way over to the other side of the street. Because when Paul preached the Old Testament and he talked about Noah's ark, he didn't just talk about the obedience of a Noah who had steadfast devotion when people laughed at him for over a hundred years. He preached that the ark was not just an ark, that the ark is Jesus himself. And that people that although they could not have predicted the wrath that was coming, if they were were in the ark they were safe and when you are in Jesus you are safe because the ark was not just about the ark and it was definitely not just about Noah the ark was about Jesus see good missionaries they, they contextualize and, and that's what Paul does here he, he says Greeks they want the, you know the, the Greeks and, and Jews they want wisdom and power in the message of Jesus and the cross it's wisdom and power and I don't know what you're really looking for right now what I'm letting you know is the wisdom you want is in Jesus. It's not just in a TED Talk. It's not in a Tony Robbins seminar. It's not, and there's a lot of very good principles out there. What I'm telling you is the wisdom you want is Jesus. And the power you need, it's found in Jesus. And the life that you're looking for, it's in Jesus. That's why it says in Colossians chapter 2 verse 10, you are complete in him. You are complete in him. You know, the the question really does come down to, um, is, is this book fundamentally about us or is it about God? I, I'll just give you one example that I like to use. But David and Goliath, 
Most of my Christian life, when I would hear people talk about David and Goliath, people would get to the middle of the street. They would, they'd be crossing the street, and they did hermeneutics to the middle. They would extract the principles, and they'd get out to the middle of it. Or they, they would do the exegetical work, what was going on with the Philistines, and, and they would get back to, you know, what was going on with Israel, and, the, and they'd do the exegetical work, and they'd get to the middle of the road, but they never made it all the way across because they never got to Jesus. Because if you read the book If you're reading Samuel and you read about David and Goliath and you think it's about you, if it's basically about you, then what you're going to do is you're going to hear someone get up and say, come on, gang, you got to go do hard things. There's a very good book that's written called Do Hard Things, okay? Come on, try a hard thing every single day. It's a good thing to do, very good thing to do, very good wisdom, very good natural wisdom. And you're going to say, you've got to try really hard to fight your giants, and David and Goliath serves as an example. And when it's about you, that, that what it means is that you've got to try really hard and you've got to be really bold and, and don't be scared and, and all these kinds of things. But if, if the story is not fundamentally about you and it's really about Jesus and his salvation and his redemption, then what that means is I've got to ask the question, how does the story of David and Goliath not just point to my need to be bold, but point to Jesus's heroic salvation and redemption? If it's really about him then that means I recognize, oh wait, I should go be bold against my giants, but there are going to be days, maybe a lot of days, when I'm not. But there was someone who was the ultimate David, which was Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the ultimate David. He's the ultimate son of David, by the way. And the ultimate David that faced the ultimate giants of wrath and sin and law and death. He faced the ultimate Goliath for me. On until I realize that, that I'll never be able to go up against my giants until I realize he's taken the ultimate giant. You see, the story of David was the Philistines were on one side and the Israelites were on the other. And that when David destroyed Goliath, all of the Israelites won because David was their representative. That when David won, they won. That was the message of David and Goliath, which means... I recognize that in this story of redemption and salvation, there is a redeemer, savior, whose name is Jesus. And what I have come to find is that when I'm having hard times, let's just get real, man. I have a hard time. I struggle with rejection. I struggle with bad moods. I struggle with basic little infirmities. When I'm struggling against my little giants, what I find is that when I look to the one who beat the ultimate giant of sin, law, death, hell, now I can face my little giants because the message of David and Goliath is not just so much about Me, it's about him. Until I get to Jesus, my sermons are TED Talks. Until you get to to Jesus, your Bible studies are just, you're just reading a blog. Don't get get me wrong, I know these words are, are, I know that these words are true. I know that this, this book is living and active. What I'm telling you is Jesus said, you have not fully crossed the street of interpretation until you get to Jesus. Okay, Mike, what do you want me to do? This week, I want you to study the Bible. And this week, when you study the Bible, First, do the exege- exegetical work we talked about last week. You know, what was it saying back then and there? What is it saying here and now? But every single time you read and study the Bible, I want you to ask, how does this point to Jesus and his redemption? How does this point to Christ and him crucified? How does this lead me to Jesus and how I'm complete in him? Not in myself, in him. Not with other people's help, in him. I'll let other people help me, but it's him. You are complete in him. This week, when you read the Bible, every single day, ask, how does this get me back to Jesus? Show your kids, with your roommates, in your microchurches, get it back to Jesus, and then you're going to be doing the real deal. I'll just close it like this. Two years ago, I was in Hong Kong at a missions meeting, and there were all these missionaries that were great and wonderful. But it was a little embarrassing because I was one of the only pastors that was there. And these are all missionaries that are doing things all over the world in very, very dangerous places. These are heroes. And I would meet people, and they would ask, uh, you know, well, where, hey, where are you serving? And I would, you know, I'd kind of tell them. And every time I would tell them, they'd just say, oh, you're a pastor. I'm like, yeah. And it was like a dis- disappointment. Oh, you're just a pastor. You're just a pastor. Well, I heard there was this table of African pastors. And I just, frankly, I just wanted to go get around someone normal. So I went around, you know, I was tired of people looking at me going, oh, you're just a pastor. So I go to this, this place, uh, this table full of Mozamb- uh, pastors from Mozambique. And I sat down there, and we just started to kind of talk and, and compare notes or whatever. And, um. And someone asked me, they said, well, hey, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm a pastor. I said, oh, so are we. I said, oh, great. And then they said, well, you know, how big is your church? 
And so I told them, they said, oh, it's a small church. <laughs> I said, no matter where I go, I'm like the dork. I was like the president of the chess club is how I felt in this meeting. And, uh, and I said, well, where are you guys from? They said, oh, we're all from the same church. I said, really? I said, well, you know, how big is your church? They said, oh, it's over 100,000 people. Last year, we, we had like 20,000 people get baptized, you know. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're describing this. They said, yeah, we have 105 pastors that are on our staff. And the senior pastor was right there. And I'm like, I said, brother, how, how do you guys do this? To which he said, we lift up Jesus and he will draw men to himself. Lift up Jesus. Lift up Jesus. Jesus. And they told me about just that week before they had, they had walked, you know, people were walking hundreds of kilometers to be able to go do their baptisms because there was no water in the area where they were. And, and they'd have hundreds of people going to get baptized because the scripture says, if, if you're going to believe Jesus, you need to repent and be baptized. And, and they take it seriously. And all over Mozambique, people are going, they'll go to the beach to be able to go and get baptized in the name of Jesus because Jesus is worthy of our all. Jesus is worthy of our all. And that's what I'm calling you to do now. I call you as we close this sermon and service today, in Orlando and South Florida, wherever you're watching, to lift up Jesus. Every time you open this Bible, to lift up Jesus. Every time you walk into a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday, to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And I promise you, you will be complete in him. If you've never turned to him, I challenge you to do that today. If you've never surrendered your life to him, I challenge you to surrender your heart to him, to lift up Jesus who died for you. Lift up Jesus who was buried for you. Lift up Jesus who was raised from the dead because when you look at him, you change and he'll change you forever. If you need to do that, would you pray this with me right now? Say, dear God, I surrender my heart to you. I give my life to you. Say this out loud. Jesus, you are Lord. I give you all of me. I ask for your forgiveness. And I pledge to you my allegiance. Be my king. Be my leader. Be my forgiver. All the days of my life. Thank you. Amen. Amen. You guys take it from here. God bless you. Go in peace in Jesus' name. Greenhouse, see you next time.